was quite the introduction. <laughs> Hope I can deliver. Um, the Battle of Chickamauga. Daniel Harvey Hill called it the Barren Victory. And that got me to thinking a little bit uh, about Civil War battles in general and uh, the outcome of Chattanooga, or Chickamauga specifically. Chickamauga was fought September 18th through 20th, 1863. Um, it was the culmination of a three-week campaign for control of the city of Chattanooga. And I like talking to Midwestern groups, uh, hometown groups like this, because how many of us have driven to Florida? And chances are we've driven right through Chattanooga. So we kind of have a sense of the geography. When I, uh, when I spoke to the uh, Hagerstown Civil War Roundtable last spring, nobody had driven through Chattanooga. <laughs> a couple had, but uh, by and large, uh, the East Coast folks just go right down I-95. Um, it was the second largest battle of the Civil War, certainly by casualties. Uh, approximately 35,000 of the 125,000 soldiers involved, Union and Confederate, ended up uh, on the casualty rolls uh, at the end of those three days of fighting. It was um, uh, arguably one of the hardest fought battles of the war. Um, the Confederates ended up losing 18,454 casualties. At least that's the official count. Those losses might have gone higher. There's at least one estimate that places the, their casualties above 20,000. Union casualties are a little bit uh, firmer. The federal records are better preserved, so we know approximately 16,350 Union soldiers were killed, wounded, or missing. And this happened uh, in the uh, in a small rural community uh, approximately 12 miles south of the city of Chattanooga in North Georgia, uh, which at the time was recently settled. It had been part of the Cherokee uh, land resettlement. And so uh, unlike eastern battlefields or some other battlefields you've seen, uh, uh, the, uh, the cabins, the, the, the farm the farms at Chickamauga were all uh, fairly primitive, small clearings, uh, uh, log cabins, very much a frontier uh, uh, atmosphere. Chattanooga itself was the closest major city. Uh, it only had a population of about 2,500 before the war. Uh, it was uh, the, the hub of a couple of different railroads, so there were some uh, egress, but by and large, uh, when you dump 35,000 casualties on a, on a, a country or a, a countryside this remote, uh, the results are pretty devastating. The, uh, the battle itself, I'll briefly describe, describe just what happened on September 20th. Um, I, given the, the weight of the books over there on the table, you, uh, you probably realize it could talk for a while about Chickamauga. <laughs> so I'll try and summarize, because September 20 is the, is the critical day of the battle. September 18th uh, was uh, a development, uh, was mostly uh, small fighting between Union cavalry and some Confederate infantry. September 19th was uh, the first major day of combat. Uh, and for both armies, the fighting on September 19th was very confused. A lot of back and forth, pushing and shoving. Uh, no senior officers really had any control over the battlefield. Uh, and the armies essentially ended up about where they started. Uh, the battle began at 7.30 in the morning on September 19th and ended well after dark, approximately 9 or 9.30 in the evening. And at the end of the day, nobody had anything to show for it except uh, some very full hospital tents. September 20th, however, began a little differently. It was a Sunday. Um, uh, the Union commander, William Stark Rosecrans, had uh, opted to go on the defensive on September 20th. 
He knew by then he was outnumbered. The Confederates, uh, in response to uh, to uh, Rosecrans' uh, arrival in North Georgia, the Confederates had rushed troops from Mississippi and Virginia and other points uh, to reinforce his opponent, Confederate General Braxton Bragg. And so Rosecrans believed that he was heavily outnumbered. And so he elected not to conduct offensive operations on the 20th. And Bragg uh, attempted to try and attack on the morning of September 20th. There were a great number of delays in the Confederate command structure, a significant number of problems. Uh, the Confederates who intended to attack at what was called day dawn, which was approximately 5 or 5.30 in the morning, the hours before sunrise. Uh, that attack never uh, uh, materialized. They finally launched their first combat, their first offensive combat, at 9.30 in the morning. Um, as if to compensate the, the fates or the gods or, or uh, union errors on their side of the line, um, a gap was opened through miscommunication in orders. The gap was opened in the uh, in the Union line at a place called the Brotherton Farm. The Union Infantry Division pulled out of line uh, uh, in response to a, a misunderstood order and created about an 800-yard uh, frontage gap in the Union battle line. And th at that moment, some of those Confederate reinforcements led by James Longstreet attacked. This was an accidental uh, intervention. Uh, Longstreet had no idea that that gap was open, but it was very fortuitous. The end result for the battle on September 20th uh, was that one-third of the Union Army was routed off the battlefield. The Union Army commander, General Rosecrans, as well as two Union Corps commanders, Alexander McDowell McCook and Thomas L. Crittenden, left the battlefield, uh, were driven off, uh, separated from their troops, uh, a Union Infantry Division commander, James Scott Negley, also left the battlefield. Uh, he could find uh, no one in command to give him any further direction. He was afraid that his command would be captured, and so he marched off the battlefield. Probably the, the at least part of this story you know, General George Thomas rallied uh, troops on, on uh, Horseshoe Ridge, Snodgrass Hill, uh, and also preserved part of his original battle line around the Kelly Farm. And so the afternoon of September 20th was marked by a desperate Union defense as they tried to hold out um, and uh, uh, preserve, hang on to whatever they could, prevent disaster from uh, expanding. By the end of the day on September 20th, uh, General Thomas uh, knew that he couldn't hold out uh, certainly couldn't retain the field through through the night. Uh, he had several problems. He his ammunition wagons had left the battlefield without him. He was very unhappy about that. His uh, uh, his his line as it uh, evolved uh, on the afternoon of September twentieth wasn't really a battle line. It was more like uh, two separate. Uh, uh, defensive positions separated by uh, yet another gap because Thomas just simply didn't have enough troops to hold the whole position. And he didn't know what had become of the rest of the army until late in the day. So Thomas decided to retreat. He made that decision about 4.30 in the afternoon of September 20th. And uh, within an hour, federal infantry began uh, withdrawing uh, about five miles, four miles northward, about two, a third of the way back towards Chattanooga, to a place called Rossville, and the Rossville Gap, which sits in Missionary Ridge. Um, Missionary Ridge at the Rossville Gap is a very strong defensive position. Um, it was, uh, it, it, only it only doesn't figure in Civil War lore, simply because uh, it was so strong that uh, General Braxton Bragg decided not to attack it on September 21st. And that kind of in a nutshell is what happened uh, 
on September 20th, how the Battle of Chickamauga ended. And Civil War battles are not, by and large, these decisive uh, world-changing events the way some Napoleonic battles were, some the way some battles in, in the 1700s were. Uh, as we study the Civil War, we realize more and more that these were attritional struggles, uh, and, and victory was often measured largely by who held the battlefield, who, who captured more men, uh, guns, uh, flags, that sort of thing. Braxton Bragg, by most conventional measures, uh, achieved more of those trophies. The Federal Army uh, captured approximately 1,500 unwounded Confederates during the course of the three days fighting. Uh, I'm sorry, the Union Army captured approximately 1,500 unwounded Confederates. The Confederates captured uh, uh, 5,000 unwounded Federals. Full, almost a third of the Union casualties were prisoners of war, men who had been cut off or isolated. Uh, Bragg was able to uh, tell Richmond, uh, the Confederate government in Richmond, that he had captured 36 cannon, 15,000 stand of small arms, and 25 battle flags. He sent those battle flags on to Richmond uh, on, a, on a train with, a, with an escort and a, and a personal messenger to present all those flags to Confederate President Jefferson Davis. The South declared a great victory. Uh, the, uh, as the news of this Confederate victory spread across the, the rest of the South on September 21 and 22 through the Telegraph, um, cities across the South uh, published, and you know, newspapers published headlines pro pro proclaiming this great success. And why not? It had been a bad summer for the South. Gettysburg, Lee retreated. Uh, that was, at best, in Southern views, a draw, uh, and then Vicksburg cannot be considered anything but uh, a serious and crippling defeat. So the news of Chickamauga was like a tonic to the Southern home front, and it was celebrated and played up a great deal. Uh, people expected to hear yet more news every day. Conversely, in the North, the initial reports from the battlefield of Chickamauga uh, shocked many of the North, many people in the North. They certainly shocked Abraham Lincoln and, uh, and Secretary of War Edwin Stanton. Uh, this was a disaster. This uh, looked like it, uh, if you'd asked them in August 1863, it looked like the, the war was progressing nicely for a change. And here we are a month later, and it looks like a defeat uh, and, and possibly a reversal of, of all of the Union fortunes in the last. But the Union soldiers and Rosecrans himself didn't necessarily, necessarily feel like they had been defeated. One of the things you come across in uh, letters and diaries uh, certainly letters home. Um, and then, of course, as, as, as I sp spent time researching and, and going into the post-war memoirs, one of the things you notice is that a lot of the Union soldiers insisted that they won. They weren't defeated at Chickamauga. Yes, they'd been a tactical reverse, but when they fell back, they fell back to the city of Chattanooga. And let's take a step back and think about why they thought it was a victory. At the end of August 1863, General Rosecrans sat on the north bank of the Tennessee River, and he looked at his maps uh, of the terrain. He had to cross uh, one of the major rivers of the United States. <clears throat> Chattanooga itself sat uh, at the southern end of the Appalachian Mountain chain. Uh, uh, the mountains that run all the way from New York down into Alabama. Chattanooga is one of the very few easy passages through that mountain chain, and because of, 
because of the Tennessee, it's it's one of the uh, essentially water level gaps that are cut through those mountains, which is why Chattanooga became a railroad town uh, in the late 1850s, because that's where they could build the railroads. They didn't need to uh, uh, cut massive tunnels through the mountains, or or it was very difficult uh, to uh, to lay track. Uh, and, and often you were going nowhere. But Chattanooga provided uh, essentially a transportation hub. It was one of the most strategic points uh, in, the, uh, in the theater of war. And it was Rosecrans' primary objective in his campaign. Um, and he knew that if he went straight at Chattanooga at the end of August, 1863, uh, he would face a very difficult fight. He would have to assault Confederate infantry dug in on, on ridgetops and mountaintops. Uh, he would have to force his way across uh, the Tennessee River. And looking at all those obstacles, he decided instead not to go directly at Chattanooga, but instead to maneuver to the south. So he crossed the Tennessee River in northern Alabama. And instead of then turning sort of uh, west uh, I'm sorry, east and northeast, back towards Chattanooga to follow the railroad into Chattanooga. He cut across uh, Sand Mountain and Lookout Mountain and across these mountains and valleys in North Georgia to threaten Bragg's line of communication, Western and Atlantic Railroad. If you go on the trip next spring, you'll get a real good look at that railroad. It was the critical lifeline for Braxton Bragg's army. His troops would starve. They would, uh, the, in short order, if they remained in Chattanooga without uh, access to uh, Confederate rail supplies. At the same time, another Union army would enter East Tennessee under Ambrose Burnside. They would capture Knoxville in early September. Uh, and, uh, and so Bragg ran a real risk of being isolated in Chattanooga. Of course, Rosecrans was taking great risks, too. He was essentially moving away from his own supply line, moving deep into Confederate territory, and having to move on a broad front offered a great many opportunities for Bragg to counterattack. But still, as the two armies maneuvered in the, in the first weeks of September, the first week of September, Braxton Bragg made a fateful decision. On September 8, 1863, he decided that he had no choice but to abandon the city of Chattanooga. <coughs> On September 9th, Union troops occupied that city fully 10 days uh, before the Battle of Chattanooga began, or the I'm sorry, the Battle of Chickamauga began. And what, and what was most significant about that occupation is that throughout the rest of the war, it would be a Union city. Chattanooga would become a critical supply link, a critical supply hub for the Atlantic campaign, uh, and, uh, and it gave the Federal Army control of the entire state of Tennessee. So Bragg's decision to abandon Chattanooga, as, as sound as it was tactically, because Bragg had very few options that would allow him to retain control of the city, um, and, and also to meet uh, General Rosecrans on equal terms. Uh, Bragg, when he decided that he had to leave Chattanooga, he essentially had surrendered to Rosecrans the main objective of the campaign. Now Bragg's going to be reinforced. I mentioned those reinforcements. They came pouring in from all across the South. Uh, when Bragg left the city of Chattanooga, he, he, his army numbered approximately 40,000 men. Uh, when, uh, when the time came for the battle, uh, his army, even after casualties, approached 70,000 troops. So uh, Bragg, Bragg's army essentially doubled in size. And that, of course... Is, is one of the major factors why General Rosecrans ran into such trouble, and ultimately why Rosecrans decided to go on the defensive and then retreat back into Chattanooga. 
September 21, 1863, Monday morning, was a kind of unusual day. Uh, the aftermath of any great battle is an unusual day. But um, what was most striking to me uh, about what happened on, on September 21st is that, and I made reference to this a minute ago when I opened, General D.H. Hill would, would later call it a barren victory. And what happened on September 21st, or what the Confederates did, or, reali or in reality didn't do on September 21st, is why General Hill called it a barren victory. As the sun rose on September 21st, most Confederate troops on the field of Chickamauga expected that the battle was not over. They expected to fight almost immediately. Um, at 6.30 in the morning, when General Bragg uh, sent a courier to General Longstreet's headquarters in front of Horseshoe Ridge uh, and said, come to my headquarters, come to Army headquarters so we can confer, Longstreet sent that courier back with a message that said, I can't leave my front right now. I am about to be attacked. But over time, Confederate memories would sort of flip that on its ear. And in large part, that's due to General Forrest. General Forrest was one of Bragg's ca uh, cavalry commanders. He commanded a cavalry corps uh, of two divisions. And on the morning of September 21st, uh, he made a reconnaissance about 7.30 in the morning. Uh, he rode forward with, with a detachment of cavalry. Uh, Forrest is the kind of guy who didn't send people, he led people. Uh, most of the time, we like that as a quality in, le in leadership, but every once in a while, um, if you take 400 guys and go riding off and don't give the rest of your 6,000 man, man corps any instructions, that's not such a good thing, and that's kind of what happened here. General Forrest uh, led a, a reconnaissance, they climbed a portion of Missionary Ridge south of Rossville, and then at 7.30 in the morning, he, he penned a dispatch to another Confederate general, Leonidas Polk. And in that message, which has been widely quoted and has become very famous, he wrote, General, we are in a mile of Rossville, have been on the point of Missionary Ridge. We can see Chattanooga and everything around. The enemy's trains are leaving, going around the point of Lookout Mountain. The prisoners captured report the pontoon thrown across for the purpose of retreating. I think they are evacuating as hard as they can go. They are cutting timber. Uh, they are cutting timber to obstruct our passage. And he concludes by saying, "I think we ought to press forward as rapidly as possible." And before us, Brigadier General, uh, and at the bottom of that dispatch, he wrote, please forward to General Bragg. Historians, and, and certainly the Confederate generals in Bragg's army, would later use this dispatch to beat Bragg up pretty badly for failing to pursue that that sort of elusive chimera that, that we believe, uh, or that military victory uh, comes from. All through the Civil War, we hear that General So-and-so failed, uh, fail, failed to follow up his victory. He failed to pursue. And uh, in this case, they're right. General Bragg did not pursue. But why didn't he pursue? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, I mentioned uh, General Longstreet uh, didn't know where the Union Army was at 6.30 in, uh, in the morning. He said he was about to be attacked. It turned out not to be the case. General Polk, the recipient of this message, uh, would write to his wife at 9.30, uh, three hours or two hours after General Forrest wrote this dispatch, uh, uh, Polk would write that we did not realize where the Union Army had gotten to until about 9.30 this morning. So there was a great deal of confusion in the, uh, in the Confederate command structure. 
And also, uh, or, or that confusion was exacerbated, I should say, by, uh, by what Forrest left out in that message. When I read that message to you, what doesn't it say? It doesn't say anything about where the Union Army is. Well, when Forrest was on the point of Missionary Ridge, he was overlooking Rossville, and what he should have been able to see, what he certainly did see, though he must not have thought it significant, was, was the 30,000 surviving federal troops uh, deployed on Missionary Ridge uh, in and around Rossville and ready to fight him. Uh, later on that afternoon, uh, Forrest's cavalry would attempt to take the gap, Rossville Gap, and be repulsed. Uh, Bragg, when he realized where the Federals were, decided not to attack because it was such a strong position. The end result was that there was no pursuit on September 21st, and probably for very good reason. Bragg also had some logistical problems uh, that are largely not appreciated. Um, I said that his army doubled. He went from 40,000 men to close to 70,000, 75,000. Uh, plus he had now uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of, of uh, uh, 14,000 of his own uh, wounded to care for, plus five or 6,000 federal wounded to care for. But what, this, what the Confederacy did not send him, when they sent him all these extra troops, they did not send him the supply trains, the wagons. Longstreet's Corps moved from Virginia to North Georgia, leaving their wagons and artillery behind. Uh, when Walker's Reserve Corps moved from Mississippi to uh, North Georgia, they left many of, the, uh, of their transportation. Uh, many of their wagons behind. Why? The Confederate rail system was not capable of handling that much traffic in that amount of time. The idea was that those wagons would catch up later. Well, General James Longstreet, who went to Knoxville in November of 1863, still didn't have any wagons when he went to Knoxville. So the idea that those wagons would catching up and would eventually uh, uh, support Bragg's army, uh, that idea never really materialized. And this is a, a very serious problem for Braxton Bragg. His railhead is about 10 miles away in a town called Ringgold. His army has been marching and fighting for several weeks in North Georgia. And typically, when, when you issue orders to an infantry division or a corps uh, on either side, Generally, the, the, the senior, the army command writes an order and we're going to prepare to march. You will march at so-and-so day, and in the meantime, have the troops cook three days' rations. They would be issued their food for the next three days. They would cook it or prepare it how they wanted. Um, some of them would eat it all right away, uh, <laughs> which it presents its own problems. But I, in general, um, the, uh, the, the troops that would move had a, a three-day logistical tether, and after that, they needed more food. Guess what? They were out of food by September 21st. Most of the Confederate infantry had to move closer to the Confederate rail, railhead at Ringgold so that the wagons that Bragg did have could bring up food and supplies uh, and allow them to cook more rations and be ready for the next movement as well as, of course, deal with the horrific impacts of the Battle of Chickamauga. Bragg would face uh, some of these same operational considerations, some of these same problems in the, in the following weeks. On September 22nd, 1863, um, after the Union Army had held Rossville Gap for a day, uh, and stragglers and, and reorganization brought the Union strength up a bit, uh, Rosecrans decided that he would have to retreat into a closer defensive line around the city of Chattanooga. Bragg's position at Missionary Ridge of Rossville Gap was very strong if the Confederates attacked them head on. 
But now, uh, but now Rosecrans' position uh, was the reverse of what, uh, what or, or was very similar to what Bragg faced when Bragg held Chattanooga. If Bragg moved to the north or uh, west, he could outflank the Union line at Rossville Gap, and Rosecrans, with his depleted army, with uh, no more than 30,000 infantry, uh, simply didn't have enough troops to hold what would need to be a roughly nine-mile frontage to hang on to Missionary Ridge and Lookout Mountain. So Rosecrans elected to retreat to the immediate fortifications of Chattanooga, sort of huddle up against a, a, a loop in the Tennessee River where the city sits, and, um, and dig in. And they dug like beavers. They created uh, a veritable Gibraltar, in the words of, of one Confederate officer. They, uh, they used existing Confederate earthworks um, and from before the campaign, and they threw up extensive works of their own. Uh, they established batteries and, uh, and entrenched heavily. So that by September 22nd, when and uh, early on the 23rd, when Confederate infantry followed the Union Army back towards Chattanooga, the first thing they saw were these very imposing fortifications. And Bragg knew, once again, that a direct frontal assault would probably produce enormous casualties and would be very unlikely to take the city. His remaining options were pretty limited. <clears throat> James Longstreet proposed that the Confederate Army move into East Tennessee, go up towards Knoxville, drive Ambrose Burnside out of Knoxville, and then move uh, west across, uh, the, across the mountains of East Tennessee and towards Nashville. If they took Nashville, or if they cut the rail line between Nashville and Chattanooga, then it would be Rosecrans who was trapped in Chattanooga without any supply line. This is a great idea in theory. Uh, it's, it's classic military strategy. Uh, certainly Robert E. Lee favored turning movements and James Longstreet had learned his trade under Robert E. Lee. But once again, what don't we have? We don't have wagons. We can't conduct such a movement. We don't have pontoon trains. Bragg does have pontoons, but when he evacuated, he sent them 60 miles south to a place called Cartersville, Georgia. And now the Western and Atlantic Railroad, the rickety, overstretched, over, overworked Western and Atlantic Railroad, was so busy hauling supplies for Bragg's swollen army that if they interrupted those supplies, those carloads, to, uh, to load the pontoons and move them north, they would have supply shortages uh, in, in the ranks. Uh, even a more limited movement uh, directly uh, towards the, the uh, Union cities or the Alabama cities of Bridgeport and Stevenson, Alabama, was pretty difficult because the Confederates simply didn't have the logistical capability to throw a large body of troops across Lookout Mountain. It all comes down to the most humble of articles, supply wagons. So Braxton Bragg really had, uh, ended up adopting the only strategy that, that logistically made sense for him. The only option he really had was to try and lay siege to Chattanooga. He would surround the Union Army on the south bank. Uh, he would uh, send his cavalry across the Tennessee River to raid uh, into Middle Tennessee and try and disrupt the Union supplies that were coming down by rail and wagon, uh, and hope that that would be enough to starve out General Rosecrans. In the end, that didn't work. Uh, that, the, uh, the alarm, the panic button that was sort of hit in Washington, D.C. by Lincoln and Stanton and uh, uh, Henry Halleck ended up uh, sending ma many thousands of federal troops to Chattanooga, uh, and most importantly, perhaps, Ulysses S. Grant to Chattanooga. The federal government gave Grant operational control of the entire 
Western theater at that point. And so Grant was able to use that authority to orchestrate reinforcements from his own army under Sherman uh, to take command of, of troops sent from Virginia under Joseph Hooker uh, to Union Corps, the 11th and 12th Corps, that would eventually become renamed the 20th Corps uh, and join the Army of the Cumberland. And now it was the Union Army's turn to double in size, to go from 35,000 to perhaps 85 or almost 90,000 troops. Uh, all while through the month of uh, uh, through the months of October and November, the Confederates were sending troops away. Bragg sent troops back to Mississippi because uh, the Confederate general there in Mississippi was worried about uh, being outnumbered. And most famously, he diverted, well, he didn't divert, Je Jefferson Davis ordered James Longstreet to go into East Tennessee, uh, well, really for two reasons. One, Robert E. Lee wanted Longstreet back. Longstreet had taken two of uh, Lee's divisions, 11,000 of Lee's best men, and Lee would like them returned. Uh, and on the way, maybe they could uh, recapture Knoxville. That turned out not to happen, but, uh, but ultimately, uh, in, on the first, in the first week in November, James Longstreet marches out of uh, Bragg's sphere of authority into East Tennessee and eventually all the way back to Virginia. So the, the campaign really splits down into uh, these sort of multiple levels. In the 19th century, when military tacticians, when military theorists started to talk about the theory of war, men like Clausewitz and Jomini, uh, a couple of lesser known uh, uh, European commanders, they divided the art of war into two levels. The tactical, concerned with the planning and conduct of battle, concerned with the handling of troops on the battlefield, uh, orchestrating events to win battles. And strategy, concerned with the art and science of employing national power. And those two levels, there's, there's some debate uh, among theorists, some variations. You might, have, you might hear the term grand tactics from time to time, or even grand strategy. But essentially, those two levels of warfare were military theory up through the 19th century. And we really, it really takes us uh, into the 20th century before, uh, and we really have, we really uh, owe this to the Russians, um, before a third level becomes commonly defined, the operational art of war, which is concerned with the planning of conduct of campaigns, or in other words, the orchestrating of battles in order to achieve your campaign objectives. And it's really at that third level, that operational level, uh, that uh, I think makes this campaign so interesting. Uh, it's also why we can argue that William Stark Rosecrans and the Army of the Cumberland were defeated at the tactical level of warfare. I mean, that's really, uh, it's hard to argue with a third of your army, uh, your general, and two of your corps commanders running off the battlefield. It's, it's hard to say that's a success. But at the end of the fighting, uh, when the sun rose on September 21, the Union Army, not the Confederate Army, occupied the principal objective of the campaign. So Braxton Bragg, though he won the battle, was defeated at the operational level. He lost the campaign. He never took Chattanooga back. And if the operational art of war is orchestrating battles so that you achieve your campaign objectives, then in that sense, General Hill is right. Chickamauga is a barren victory. It did not achieve its campaign objective. I also find it uh, fascinating that what happened in the aftermath of this campaign uh, with these two armies uh, is very similar in a lot of ways. 
at the uh, uh, two Union Corps commanders, the, the two men I mentioned, Alexander McDowell McCook and Thomas L. Crittenden, both lost their commands. They requested courts of inquiry, uh, were cleared by those courts of inquiry. They were driven off the field, and though their conduct was at times not optimal, uh, the courts uh, basically cleared them of any accu accusations of cowardice or incompetence. Uh, said they were, you know, essentially could return to command, though they never really did. General uh, Thomas Crittenden briefly commanded a Union division during the Spotsylvania campaign in Virginia under Grant uh, in 1864. Uh, and uh, Alexander McDonald McCook's greatest claim to fame, uh, Civil War fame anyway, uh, was that uh, he was the man in charge uh, of the defenses of Washington during the Battle of Fort Stevens. So technically, he's the guy who repulsed early, though he didn't really have all that much to do with it. Um, but neither of them held significant operational command again in the Civil War. They would both have post-war army careers, uh, and, and do quite well. But by uh, but September 20, 1863, ruined both of their wartime careers. The Union Divisional Commander, James Scott Negley, asked for a court of inquiry, never got one, uh, was ordered by Grant to leave the department, eventually returned to his hometown of Pittsburgh, uh, there to await orders. When those orders never came, he finally resigned in the waning days of the war, resigned his commission and resumed civil life. Uh, Rosecrans will lose his own job. Uh, when Ulysses S. Grant is given overall authority in the Western Theater uh, on October 16, 1863, Grant is offered two options. He, he can uh, publish his new uh, command authority uh, with a set of orders that retains William Stark Rosecrans in command of the Army of the Cumberland under his now under Grant's overall direction. Or he can publish an exact uh, uh, copy of those orders with one great exception. George Thomas would take command of the Army of the Cumberland. Unhesitatingly, Grant chose to replace Rosecrans with Thomas, and General Rosecrans will end his war uh, commanding the Department of the Missouri, the Department of the Missouri, uh, in 1864, he will conduct military operations against Sterling Price's raid in Missouri uh, late in that year. Um, obviously, there will be bad blood between Grant and Rosecrans throughout the well, throughout the rest of both of their lives. Uh, uh, Grant ascends to command of the uh, Overall Army. After the war, he's he's the commander, in, well, not commander in chief, but the senior military commander of the United States Army. Rosecrans sees the handwriting on the wall and resigns in 1866. Um, Rosecrans will will work towards federal appoint, appointments. Uh, he's appoint, appointed ambassador to Mexico. When Grant ascends to the presidency, he loses the ambassadorship to Mexico. Uh, <laughs> But essentially, the Army of the Cumberland changed dramatically because of the results of, of Chickamauga. But so too did the Army of the Tennessee, or I'm sorry, the Army of Tennessee. I always make that mistake. So we've got to be careful. The Army of the Tennessee was Grant's army. The Army of Tennessee is the Confederate Army. Uh, the Army of Tennessee, under Braxton Bragg, uh, did something very similar. Bragg relieved two corps commanders, arrested them, sent them to Atlanta to await. Well, he arrested one corps commander, Leonidas Pohl. Uh, he requested the immediate transfer of another corps commander, D.H. Hill. Uh, and he arrested a divisional commander. Uh, all, all of these men were found wanting uh, for, and fail, failed to follow orders. The divisional commander, uh, Thomas Carmichael Heinemann and Leonidas Polk <coughs> both requested court marshals, uh, courts of inquiry, to clear their names. They never got them. D.H. Hill 
who was relieved and sent back to North Carolina, uh, also requested a court of inquiry. He never got one. General uh, President Jefferson Davis came west uh, uh, in early October in a, in a great hurry to try and resolve some of the uh, what was a, was becoming a mutiny in the ranks of the Army of Tennessee. Uh, virtually all of the uh, Confederate generals were now dissatisfied with Braxton Bragg. Uh, for reasons both uh, immediate both for, for this failure to pursue, but also uh, we have to be honest that there's a, there's a great deal of tension in the Army of Tennessee that dates all the way back to the fall of 1862 in the Perryville campaign. Uh, some, some rifts go even further back to the summer of 1862. Uh, Braxton Bragg was by and large not well liked by his other senior commanders. Uh, he was also very poorly served by many of those senior commanders. But uh, unlike uh, Robert E. Lee, who was allowed to either get rid of mutinous officers or find ways to, uh, to make them uh, join the team, as it were, Braxton Bragg uh, was never allowed to get rid of uh, disobedient officers. Uh, Jefferson Davis limited his authority in, in, in many ways. And also Braxton Bragg was not of the personality to really uh, let bygones be, got, be bygones and heal all wounds, so to speak. So essentially both armies went through this command purge, the winning army and the losing army, which gives you a sense that... Uh, Neither side felt totally defeated or, um, or totally victorious. It also, I think, gives us a pretty good sense of, of why we can say, ultimately, that uh, Rosecrans may have lost the battle when he won the campaign. Thank you. And I think we have plenty of time for questions. So, sorry, sure. just a rule of Seward, but during the Battle of Chickamauga, when there was actually uh, attacks going on to Snodgrass at all, and there was also the attacks going on to Kelly Field, but there was nothing going on in between. Why did the Confederates? have the ability to, to determine if there was a gap during the attack together. Well, first of all, the gap was wooded. Um, and second of all, uh, there were Confederate troops that penetrated that gap. The 15th South Carolina and elements of the 8th South Carolina. Uh, Humphreys Mississippi Brigade also uh, moved into that gap for a, a period of time. But none of those troops managed to communicate up to General Longstreet that there was a gap there. Uh, in part, that was because even though there were no formed bodies of troops in those woods, there were some Union skirmishers uh, and Union stragglers. And also, later on, there will be uh, at least, uh, well, there are two Union brigades, one that crosses at about 2 o'clock and one that crosses at about 4 o'clock, that make their way across that gap to move from Kelly Field to Horseshoe Ridge. And it's quite possible that detecting those movements would give the Confederates the impression that there wasn't a gap. Thomas was acutely aware of the gap. And that's one of the major reasons why he decided to retreat at uh, Fort Hill. Uh, yes, sir. Well, any of the factors that you talked about in your speech responsible Um, well, I, I yes, the short answer is almost always yes. Yeah. But um, but also we lack prestige, we lack names. Bragg and Rosecrans aren't me or even me. Uh, and finally, I think something that's that's only 
always struck me really as I was very deep into writing uh, the trilogy is how hard and how difficult this battle is to describe. Uh, there's really only been a, been a couple of studies that were attempted. Uh, the two modern studies are from Tucker, which came out in 1961, and Peter Cousins, and Raffle, which came out in 1990. Uh, and people have bitten off, you know, and I, I've known a couple of Civil War historians. Uh, Larry Daniel attempted to write a history of the Battle of Chickamauga, and I helped him with all that research. And, and about 10 years ago, he said, Well, I'm never going to finish it. He went on to write uh, Days of Glory and History of the Army of Cumberland and some other things. He's written other things since. But he just, I think he just found it overwhelming. I think most people who come to it find it overwhelming. <coughs> yeah. It took me 15, 16 years to feel like I've got a, a sense of it. And I am still in awe of how much information I don't know. Two of the men I rely most heavily on, Jim Ogden, the National Park historian there, and also Glenn Robertson, who's, who was the, uh, who taught at command and general staff school in Fort Leavenworth, he's retired, <coughs> uh, but who's, who's been rumored to be writing a book for decades. <laughs> <laughs> Literally decades. And I know he's done a lot of writing, uh, and yet, it's almost that each of us that get into it uh, get sucked into this tar pit. It's very confusing to work. Yes, sir. Uh, when I'm standing at Brotherton Farm, looking east into the timber line where the federal markers are, I've walked it, and I'm guessing it's probably from the farm to the timber line, roughly about anywhere from 250 to 300 yards. 250. Okay. Yeah. Where I, I can't see the grass was a dead gap that Wood created when he pulled his uh, men out of line that the federal line could not close that gap quick enough. That's tough to cover 250 well, yards. Well, the, uh, <coughs> bear in mind that the troops that had to cover the gap were south of the farm, so it's even worse. You need to go 400 yards to the south end of the field oh. and then 200 yards north. And 250. The gap is anywhere between 600 and 800 yards, as we define it. It's uh, it depends on unit frontages, and, and part of the problem why unit frontages are a little confusing on September 20 is because so many of these units fought on the 19th. We're not exactly sure how many men they had by the 20th. So, um, so it's even worse than that. And the, the division immediately to uh, Tom Wood South was commanded by Jefferson C. Davis. Um, and that division numbered only two brigades. It had been heavily engaged the day before on the 19th, and now numbered only about uh, 2,500 men all told. So it was barely larger than the gate. Uh, I'll get to you, Jerry. Okay. Yeah, sir. So the. Uh, the big controversy, of course, is around General Wood and whether or not he maliciously obeyed an order that he damn well knew was <laughs> issued mistakenly. What is... Uh, well, he, huh? I hold the fateful order of the day. <laughs> uh, the only book I've read on this is Cousin's book, and he, he very strongly takes the position yes. that Wood was completely at fault. Do you agree, disagree? I disagree. Okay. Uh, pretty much entirely. Uh, well, Peter Cousins says that, that, first of all, I hold the fatal order of the day in my hand. That's invented language. Uh, that's, uh, that language probably comes about in the 1920s, in this this period of, of uh, where we're telling tall tales rather than necessarily recounting solid history. The other thing is, um, Wood denies, first of all, that there were any problems. Uh, he argues quite strongly 
in, in an article in the New York Times that, that he has no problem going for his tattoo. And probably the final piece of information uh, really has to, yeah, you have to examine it from, uh, or, or you have to know that General McCook was present at that moment. And Tom Wood questioned the order. He said, if I move, I will create a gap. That's pretty well documented by his staff. And the, then the court commander, or the, the chief of staff of the 21st Corps, Lynn Starling, says, well, then I'll ride back and, and correct the order. Uh, I'll get a clarification. And at that point, uh, the Starling and, and some of the very strong Rosecrans partisans say, well, Wood said, no, 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 don't. I, this is a this is an order, and I wouldn't think of this event. And that's where they put the maliciousness in. But in fact, Wood did question it and say, you can go back. Let's find out. Alexander McDonald McCook said, it's a peremptory order. You better move. So McCook actually told him to move and said that, and, and when Tom Wood said, should I wait until you get troops up here to fill this gap, McCook said no. You go ahead and I will fill it as quickly as I can. So we've, we've shifted the burden up one level here to the court commander, the man in charge of that sector, Alexander McDonald McCook. Now, of course, after the battle, after McCook has left the battlefield and after he's being accused of all these terrible things, McCook's pretty quiet about it. <laughs> uh, having not about whether or not he had any input on this order. Frankly, that's a whole program in and of itself. How that happened, um, how the discommunication occurred. Uh, we need to talk about a couple of different orders that Rosecrans issued right around that same time frame that gave McCook the impression that not just the Union, that, that not just one Union division was moving, but that, that Rosecrans was intending to move his entire right wing and start to collapse the right wing in order to go help George Thomas. But no, I don't think Wood was behaving maliciously. Nor do I think it was Rosecrans. There's, I mentioned three people who received courts of inquiry. Thomas Wood wasn't one of them. If Rosecrans had a real problem, why didn't, you know, why didn't he bring Wood up on charges? Let me go to Jerry first. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that Thomas decided to retreat. Uh, didn't James Garfield come to Thomas at about that time with orders from Rosecrans that Thomas should retreat? Yes. Garfield um, uh, reached George Thomas at about 3, 3 45 in the afternoon. Uh, Rosecrans uh, Extended Thomas's authority to the whatever Union troops were left on the battlefield uh, to take charge uh, to fall back on Rossville, but they were discretionary. And, and Garfield, Garfield, in fact, once he realized that George Thomas had most of the army still fighting with him, Garfield argued against the treaty. He said, "Why don't we stay here?" Thomas said, well, I don't think you quite understand my tactics. <laughs> <laughs> and so Thomas okay. very clearly made He had discretion, though, in that but, order. Okay. Yes. Rosecrans gave him discretion in virtually everything. Yes, sir. Okay, so I, I've never tried, I, I've never been able to figure out or come up with any reasonable alternatives that Bragg had to what he did. And now that we know it, what we've given, what we know, using 2020 hindsight, knowing where everybody was, can you come up with any rational alternative to Brad to Brad to do other than doing what he did? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> with the caveat that uh, once the Union Army reopened the tracker line, at that point, Bragg probably should have retreated. Yeah. Even though it would have cost him his command. Of course, he's man in Well, he lost his command shortly after. Yeah, he lost, he, he lost his command because yeah. basically the Union Army chased him off of the best defensive terrain no, in 100 miles. Yeah. Uh, and it was a shocking defeat. Yes, sir. 
I actually have a comment and two questions on that. One is you mentioned about Longstreet's troops making the breakthrough. That they were under Longstreet's command, but they were all in the Army of Tennessee or East Tennessee. Or the first two lines. First two lines. Well, those those who yes punched the whole. But the way. following two divisions. Yes. Where, See, uh, you, where you, you sound like you still have a little of that Gettysburg <laughs> Eastern <laughs> <laughs> Theater. Yes. And it's very, and it is, and it's very, and it's very common. Everybody, well, Long Street, you know, Long Street Street, you know, and everybody said, well, the Long Street Street are from the Army, no, Virginia, no wonder Bright won that one battle. But, but they were. <laughs> that is true. So my <laughs> question is, okay, so Bragg, uh, two things. One is, so on the Cracker uh, line. If Longstreet had not been sent off to East Tennessee, but they maintained the blockade, if if Bragg and Longstreet had cooperated, was it, I mean I spent a lot of time trying to figure that out, um, and I've come to the conclusion that, um, and this is largely thanks to, to many discussions with Jim Ogden, that the Confederates could not project enough force on the west side of Lookout Mountain, even. Before Longstreet left, even in October, they could only spare one brigade or keep one brigade supplied on the west side of Lookout Mountain at a time. Out of Bragg's entire army, they could only keep one brigade because of the way, because of lack of wagons, because of the nature of the terrain. The Union Army planted uh, two artillery batteries on Moccasin Bend, and those two artillery batteries were able to completely command the one the the road over the, the nose of Lookout Mountain, the easy road to supply the uh, any Confederates in look in uh, Lookout Valley. So the only time the Confederates could bring supplies over the mountain was at night, and you don't want to drive the Lookout Mountain roads at night. <laughs> 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 Imagine doing it on a dirt road <laughs> with a wagon, with bulky horses, weak horses actually. Um, the, the federal horses were were greatly reduced due to starvation, but so were the Confederate horses. Uh, that, that's a whole other problem the Confederates faced from 1862 on. Is not only did they lack some wagons, but they couldn't get enough horses. They overworked the horses they had. They underfed the horses they had, and Horse, uh, livestock, uh, draft animals were a constant problem for the Army of Tennessee from mid-1863. Uh, if, if I can squeeze in one more, your, your more, most recent book dealing with, with Chattanooga, that been, I, I've never asked you about it. Hardy comes back. Yes. By, by the time, if it, in a sense, replaces Polk. What do you think of the relationship? I think one of the great mysteries is why does Hardy support Polk against Bragg? Why does Hardy turn against Bragg? Or would you disagree with that conclusion? Hardy doesn't have confidence in Bragg. Um, and, you know, uh, Matt Cheer's biography of Hardy is a very good biography, but I don't think we ever really get to the bottom of why uh, Hardy is, is such a problem. And he is a problem. He doesn't live up to the promise. Uh, Jefferson Davis brings Hardy back. He swaps Polk for Hardy, though technically Hardy comes back and uh, replaces Daniel Hardy Hill. Uh, but Polk is sent out to Mississippi and Hardy comes back. And Davis sends a wire to Hardy basically saying, I hope you can help heal the rifts in the Army of Tennessee. I'm not sure why Davis thinks that. Because Hardy was one of the principal problems in the spring of 1860. Um, yeah, yeah, see, I think he was a major one, and that uh, people think more about it with Polk. But Hardy had credibility with the Army and the West Pointers. Yeah, you know, absolutely. The professional army. Yeah. So it's like, you know, Polk could, you know, most of them could write Polk off as a crackpot. But when Hardy backed him after the Perryville campaign, it, it, it gave Polk credibility. And I, I don't understand why Hardy. Would have supported Polk against Bragg that early. I, I just don't see anything that Bragg ever did. I, th I think it stems in large part out of um, uh, Bragg's peremptory orders of Perryville to attack. Uh, and uh, I, a 
comes down to I don't think Harvey had faith in Bragg as a commander. Yes, sir. So you talked about you know, white. The main, the main part of the problem for really for Bragg's army on, on being able to keep continue to supply his troops, why didn't Richmond take a more active role in making sure that the wagon trains <coughs> they wanted to follow Longstreet got to where they were supposed to be? And why didn't they do more you know, later on? This, this is a larger war supply problem. Uh, this is a lack of industry problem. And, and, and a lack of a force function. Um, Richmond had. Well, Robert E. Lee's army had transportation problems. Uh, the Confederate Army in Mississippi had transportation problems. Uh, by the fall of 1863, uh, the, the infrastructure that made up the Confederacy, the, the railroads of its vertebrate, the, the supply, uh, the, the military wagons, and draft animals <coughs> that gave it its tactical transportation, all its field armies, were all in inferior shape. So it said didn't lose any battles because they didn't have enough rifles, they didn't have enough ammunition, they didn't have enough cartridges. They did lose battles because they were hamstrung logistically. Uh, and uh, that actually could be developed a lot more in, in Civil War history. We don't talk about that here. Yes, sir. My question involves the role of Navy. And, and Granger. Can you explain what was going on with Nagley <laughs> after the breakthrough that caused him to receive you know, the opprobrium of all? And then what about Granger's role? Seems to me he was uh, perhaps not equally uh, responsible for saving him, but he made a great contribution. He's hardly ever mentioned. Um, first, we'll take Nagley. Nagley was very sick. Uh, he had been confined to an ambulance a couple of days before. Uh, he had been uh, pulled out of line early on the day on September 20th and sent to uh, a portion of Horseshoe Ridge, uh, the Snodgrass uh, uh, farm, where Thomas expected him to establish a flank position. Uh, and then after that, he really got no other orders for, uh, for the next couple of hours. He saw uh, the Union collapse to his south. He saw war uh, flags and provincial flags streaming past him. Um, he sent two couriers to General Rosecrans right around noon uh, uh, asking for help uh, or, and further orders. Those couriers made it back to him and, and uh, they each brought the same message. Rosecrans to Nagel, you're on your own, I can't help you, uh, which isn't very heartening. And then uh, he made the decision, because he didn't have any contact with Thomas or anybody else, he made the decision to take the troops under his command, about 2,500 infantry and approximately 50 artillery vehicles, cannon and, and caissons, uh, and move back to, to Roscoe. Now, at the moment he made that decision, he was in con contact with a Union divisional commander named John Brannan, and he was observed by General Wood whose troops were busy uh, driving back the Texas Brigade in North Dyer Field. And they knew Nagley was on the top of the hill while they were fighting down below. But when they, after that fighting concluded and they fell back to Snodgrass Hill, Nagley was gone. Nagley said there were no formed troops that uh, he commanded the last formed troops on the battlefield. Both Brandon and Wood knew that was wrong. And they, more than anybody else, uh, made it their business to make sure that Negley did not come back to him. They were very, very angry. Negley is the only uh, uh, divisional commander in Thomas's report not to be named, uh, you know, not to be singled out for praise. Granger. Uh, Granger does a fine job uh, on September 20th. He moves uh, of his own accord down from Rossville reinforces Thomas at, at just the right minute. Um, but after that, he doesn't do so well. And probably uh, his biggest problems come uh, in the battles for Chattanooga when he's, he strikes Grant as inattentive and not paying attention. Uh, Peter Cousins likes to point out that Granger has uh, 
is sort of this fascination with artillery. He's an old artilleryman, and so he can't resist monkeying with the cannon. Uh, and at one point, Grant tells him to quit screwing around with that battery and get back to commanding the Corps. Um, uh, and then uh, he sends a sort of a smart aleck reply. He's sent up to help relieve Knoxville after the Battle of uh, uh, Chattanooga, and he sends a smart aleck reply back down that rubs Sherman and Grant both the wrong way. Knoxville is supposed to be starving, and, and Granger makes a crack about it. They've just sat down to this sumptuous Christmas dinner. Uh, uh, and and he's, uh, he ends up in the Department of the Gulf, and he's kind of moved away. I don't think, uh, I don't think Thomas holds him in all that high regard, or Thomas would have fought him. Okay. Yes, Thank sir. you.